in the 1870s. Uh, and uh, they actually walked from Virginia, from slavery. And they worked and lived on the reservation, which, was, uh, which would become you know, NAS, uh, the really? Naval Air Station. Okay. They stayed there. And I did some research as a project uh, about two months ago and found out that patients who came and stayed on that reservation actually worked there. They previously, when we set up the Naval Live Oaks at um, uh, President um, um, uh, John Quincy Adams, actually along with, um, uh, with his secretary of the, uh, of, the, of the Navy, actually set aside land to actually use the oak trees to build, they wanted a Navy um, um, uh, area to build ships as a, as a Navy yard. And so the slaves that were in Pensacola then uh, were used to, uh, they were hired out. And so when the war ended, my folks, my, the Williams part of my, my, my father's family came to Pensacola, stayed uh, on the, res they called it the reservation there, on NAS and actually worked as skilled laborers and work laborers and then moved up to uh, where, where we are now, about a half a mile north of where we physically are located now. It's about eight blocks, really. And uh, I grew up there uh, and I went to school here. And I take great pride that I'm one of the alumni. There, are, there may be close to 50 to 60 people that are, uh, that, are, that are now senior citizens who actually physically went to school here. And I went here as a four-year-old, and then I went to public school as a five-year-old. Well, actually, my formal name is, I'm Lillian's boy. When, when you grow up in a black neighborhood, I grew up in a neighborhood mm -hmm. where uh, we owned city, two city blocks where mm -hmm. all of my father's relatives, and we were all kin. So the front the street that I grew up on was 6th Avenue, was 6th, 7th, and 8th Avenue after Davis Highway. Now, never mind. What happened to one, two, three, four, and five? <laughs> we ended up with Sixth Avenue. It was really called Savalas. It was a Spanish name uh, right. before the uh, 1900s, but it became Sixth Avenue. And I grew up in that community with all relatives, very sheltered, very uh, um, enclosed community. Uh, wonder, I had a wonderful child, even during segregation. Uh, it, it just, I, I lived the life of most kids. We played, we had fun, uh, the relatives were there, and, and I had all of those good experiences that, that a lot of black kids have that, uh, uh, during that time in, in the, 40, the 50s and 60s. Yeah, definitely uh, were freedom, so to yeah. speak. It really was, you know? because the whole thing about, you know, if, if, you, if you did something on Davis, before you yeah. got to Sixth Avenue, a block away heading east, uh, your, your mom knew about it. And people in the neighborhood could to chastise you and, and they could uh, reprimand you and they could, they could really encourage folks. So I grew up in, a, in that kind of community, which was very loving and supportive. Uh, now, you went to this school, right? Right, right. So, but you're not in that picture, are you? Right, no, I'm not. That's okay. a 1924 picture. 1924. I, w I went there 20 years, uh, well, not 20, but maybe 26, I think. 14, let's see, it was 26, okay. so yeah. f uh, 15 years later. Oh, okay. uh, so you were uh, just 20, I guess 20, <laughs> because the school was just starting during yeah. this time. And so I got there in 51. This was before 1930. And the reason the stool got started was Mrs. Lily James, and we're about to refer to Miss Lily. Uh, Miss Lily did not think the uh, quality of education for black children was very high. So she started her own school. It was really like a, a school and a daycare center. The kids went to school from 9.30 to 3.30, and many of the mothers who worked would leave their children here till 7 o'clock. The amazing thing about it was I got a quality education for, for the cost of a coat, five cents a day, 25 cents a week, a dollar a month. But that was a tremendous amount of income for her during that time because a dollar went a long way. And, um, and so that's, that's, that's how I started my education. Okay. And many of the values that I have that I got from my mother and my father, really I got from Miss Lily because of all the things, anybody that went to school here, the 11th commandment, thou should never quit, is a mantra of the school. And amazingly, Chappie James, her son, that's one of the mantras of the, 
of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. And he carried that to Tuskegee, uh, which, which, is, which is a little, on the, it's between Montgomery and, and, um, and, um, and Auburn in Alabama. Uh, not far from Montgomery, uh, Tuskegee is not. And uh, those, those impacts and those things permeated his life and mine too. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Deborah Hendricks, and I am here with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. Today is a very rainy Thursday, and it is <laughs> June the 30th, 2022. And we are currently at the Chappie James uh, Museum, mm -hmm. Museum, and this is in Pensacola, Florida. And today we have the extreme honor of interviewing Dr. Marvin Williams. Marion. Marion. Williams. Marion. M -A okay. R I O N. Okay. Right. Well, let's let's ask ask you to spell your name okay. for that. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. Since I might know it <laughs> as a senior person. Okay, my first name is Marion, M-A-R-I-O-N, Williams, uh, W-I-L-L-I-M-S. I'm one of three Marion Williams in my family. Uh, Marion C. Williams was Marion Mosley, Marion Mosley Jr., and Marion Mosley Sr. I don't know where the name came from. I have no middle name, but I take great pride. You have to earn your name in our culture. In other words, if you're called Joseph or whatever, or, or, or if you're called John, and, and the, that goes back, I think, to biblical times. But the name that you're given, you really have to earn that name. It's not just something there. People think they pick it out of the air, but there's, there's a connection to it. I don't know where it's from, but that is true. So I have, I've spent my life earning my name Marion. Okay. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. And we're going to talk about more about connections later on, I think. Mm -hmm. But first, let's start like, kind of uh, at the beginning. And uh, let's ask you uh, where and when you were born. Okay. I was born here in Pensacola in 1947 at Lady of Angels Hospital. It's a Catholic hospital that was started uh, in Pensacola because black mothers could not actually go to the Sacred Heart or the white hospitals. The good thing is, is that I never knew in approximately 26 years I would meet the love of my life, Claudia Williams, and her family was Catholic. So I, I was born on Intendencia Street in downtown Pensacola. In that time, in 75 years, God has taken me one block south. And the, the block is very historic in itself. The church is uh, 131 years old, and, and I take great pride in that because I've actually learned the history of that area and that church. And I became a historian. Actually, I'm a trained biologist, I'm a biology teacher, really. And as a result of that, uh, I ended up being a historian uh, related, trying to find out who my uncle was, it's Spencer Bibb. There's a school uh, approximately three blocks from here. And my father never told me that Spencer Bibb was, uh, was his uncle. And so it's taken me 31 years. I, in 31 years, I've become a historian. I've written at least three books. I've published maybe six monograms. I've uh, had some other wonderful things happen in my life. But uh, I'm, I'm now a historian of note. And, uh, and it's kind of funny because I never looked to start a, a life as a, a second part of life as an educator. I guess really I'm, I'm still an educator. I'd like to think, I heard one of the old teachers say uh, some time ago that uh, uh, teachers actually preach and teach and fuss and cuss. So today I'm going to teach and preach. <laughs> okay. Okay, well. <laughs> and I'll do the latter. <laughs> Well, this is going to be a wonderful interview, I can tell. Um, let's talk about your parents, though. Uh, okay. Let's talk about your mom. All right, uh, my mother's name was Miss Lillian uh, uh, Matthews Williams, or Jenkins, excuse me, Lillian Jenkins Matthews Williams. Uh, she was a Jenkins. She was born uh, in a little place called Menners, Alabama, which is uh, above, uh, about 25 to 30 miles above Hope Hall in, uh, in, in Alabama. She met her husband, my grandfather, and, um, um, and oh, excuse me, uh, her grandfather, her, her, her father, actually uh, brought uh, uh, work for the Elenine Railroad. 
and he actually brought, moved the family from Manners uh, to, uh, to Florida and eventually to Pensacola. That's how my mother got here. My father was named Willie Alphonse Williams. My father was the grandson of George and Judah Williams, slaves born in Virginia. They actually walked to Pensacola after the Civil War, ended up at Pensacola Navy Yard, and, and then moved where we live now. Uh, about three blocks from here is a street called Jordan. That was the city limits for a long time, uh, going back to the 30s and 40s and 50s. And that area uh, uh, was called the wilderness because it was a lot of trees and, and whatever and very few houses there. The house that I, I grew up in, my grandfather bought the shell of that house in 1906 and actually built the rest of it with his hands. The house is still there today. It has been rehabbed in there and it's been gentrified. There are no black folks that live in the neighborhood that I grew up in. I, I grew up in a very self-contained neighborhood where all two city blocks, which is rare, we own all of the houses and we were all the relatives. And that's where my folks moved from there, from slavery. So I'm really, I'm, I'm a native son of Africa and a native son of Pensacola. Wow. So your, your family probably has a lot of things they've done in this community, I would say. Probably. <laughs> but they were actually middle class working black folks who, uh, my father worked uh, at NAS uh, in, in public works. My mother, during World War II, he, he worked for the Navy, and my mother worked in the kitchen. When she became pregnant in 46, uh, I was born in 47, uh, the Navy let her go. And so I had to, as a child growing up, uh, with five or six other brothers, I was the baby, youngest one, and uh, as a result of, of growing up in that house that's, that's on 6th Avenue, uh, about a half a mile from where we are here, um, I had uh, I had to to learn a lot. I grew up in a Methodist church, even though I became Catholic. My grandmother was a founding member of that church. Uh, my uncle Spencer Bibb actually worked at that church in the early 1900s, and so all of these things were connected. And so it, it's kind of put the glue together. It took me 30 years, 31 years, to figure out who Spencer Bibb was about my family, my family history. But they all center within a, a mile of where we are now. Uh, uh, all of us that live in this neighborhood, we, 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 we are, um, uh, the city park was called McGee Field after Dr. McGee. And, and all of the persons that, many of the persons you're going to interview today, actually grew up on the northeast side of town. And that's, that's where I, I'm from, Pen, right here in Pensacola, a native person born, a native Pensacola, born and raised here, raised my children here, chose to stay here, loved this city. The white sands and, and the blue skies and the warm, friendly people created in me a different attitude toward people and, of course, service. I guess that's where I learned to service. But it was my mom. Uh, my father died after five heart attacks. Uh, in in um, in seventy one, and but my mother uh, was like Miss Little James. She taught me never to quit, never to give up, to get and go as far as you can with education. And I did, and I was blessed that I had the a strong emphasis of a of a really a Protestant church, interest of God and family. Uh, it goes deep in our family, and the connection of the community goes deep in my family. Wow. Uh, I, it must be uh, really amazing to have such a deep history in one one spot yeah. like that. Not many people can can right, say, can say that. that. Well, most people yeah. don't know, and uh, and I didn't. My father, uh, who grew up uh, in Pensacola, um, his father, uh, my grandfather Augustus, I was, was born right after the Civil War, and his father before him. Um, George, uh, uh, George R. Williams. It was rare for most slaves to have names, so the plantation they were on, they were probably not abused or brutalized. But when they came to Pensacola, hard work and persistence was, was good. And I think that's a, a part of who you really are. Someone said you really can't outgrow your roots because your roots are your foundation. 
And I, th I think that was, it was good for me. Uh, I, I've always loved children, uh, loved people. I uh, was always active in the church. I sang and I still do, la, 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 just a little bit. Uh, and I've had tremendous experiences. I've done a lot of first in my life. I was the first person in my family to go to college. I was the first person to finish uh, at the uh, University of West Florida. I was among the first, I got the first 89 degrees at the University of West Florida. And, and of all of the families and friends, I'm the first in my family, well, actually I'm the second there in the PhD. I had a cousin they, they said had an EDD, but I'm the first to have a PhD. So lots of firsts. Um, and um, it's taught me to, to, to be resilient, to be persistent, to not give up. Uh, you don't have to be um, a brain surgeon, but you have to really know uh, that it's nothing wrong with being uh, a surgeon, as well as it, it's nothing wrong with being a garbage man. It's nothing wrong with being a gardener, as long as you're the best that you can be. And that whatever happens, you've got to remember that there are other people and you have to treat them in a way that you want to be treated. And I think that too was one of the strong features that I picked up from Lily James. I'm like a big sponge if you really would look at it. Everywhere you go, you absorb the culture and the experiences. It just so happened that I had a tremendous memory for most of my life. Now I'm 75, I can't remember my name. <laughs> but, but, but it just happened, for me, it was that at the older I got, all of these connections came there, and then sorting that out was able to help me to keep a straight and narrow, to not be bitter about life, um, to not have the, um, the attitude that uh, uh, you can be from the ghetto, but you don't have to be, you don't have to live in your mind in the ghetto. You have to appreciate ghettos because Jews lost their lives in ghetto. But the word ghetto is just a separate community. And isn't that amazing? And that's where I'm from, from there. I take great pride in my name, Marion. Um, I am one of three Marions in our family. Marion C. Williams Sr. was, uh, was um, my, my dad's first cousin. His son, Marion uh, C., excuse me, Marion C. Mosley, not William, Marion C. Mosley, uh, was, was his, the senior. And the junior, Ashley, was a, a friend of Chappie James, played out in the street, became a Tus both of them became Tuskegee Airmen. And I had the pleasure of actually, the way things worked out, researching there are seven black people that I've been able, been able to document that are Tuskegee Airmen that were not necessarily known before. So uh, the, the life has many opportunities. One has to absorb the opportunity, take advantage of those, and not be hurt by the, the misfortunes of life to get over those and learn from them. That's, that's what I've done. I guess perhaps that's been the most resilient thing that, that, that's been, that I've learned as a person. Wow, well, well speaking of opportunities, uh, you say uh, your mom really stressed education. Yes. And somehow you ended up in Miss Lily's <laughs> class. So how, how did that happen? Well, that was amazing. Uh, at at four years old, I must have worried my mother to death. Okay, okay, well, let's go back a year when I was three. My mom, as I said earlier, she worked uh, on the base at NAS. Um, and my father did too during World War II. So in four, 1946, uh, when she found that she was pregnant, um, it, it required that if you worked on base and you were a female, you had to actually leave your job. She worked in the kitchen uh, during, during, during World War One. I, I mean, excuse me, World War II. And actually she moved, uh, she had to find a job. So she was a very good cook and she was a, a domestic person. She, I mean, she cleaned houses and did things like that. So she had to do something with this, this, this young kid, see, because my oldest brother was eight and my uh, closest year were eight years older than me, and the next brother was nine years older than me. So that by the time I got to be four, they were 12, and by the time I got to be eight, they were teenagers. And by the time I got to be a teenager, of course, they had been in the military now. So my mom decided that I've got to do something with this kid. So she walked me uh, half a mile every day for a year from where we lived in McGee, around McGee Field on Sixth Avenue, straight to here. Uh, 
and she paid, uh, which was amazing to me. I found I found out these neat things. She gave Miss Lily five cents. The cost of a Coca Cola when I was a boy was a nickel. She gave Miss Lily a nickel a day, five cents, for five days was twenty five cents. So for a dollar a month, I got a first class education. I learned how to say my alphabets. I learned how to count. I had learned the rudiments of reading, and you may not know it or not. In, in, 18, uh, in, in 1893, five years after the school, uh, eight years after the school district started, they were teaching phonics. I was amazing. I found an actual curriculum guide in a book that I've written for fourth edition is the history of the colored schools. And I've actually, I didn't really do the history of this school, but it was really by accident that I found that. But actually the whole curriculum was set up to teach children in one room setting, and that's what that's what we had. So I'm here at four years of age. Um, most kids who came to Miss Lily James School, actually, the mothers worked. Of course, they were all working mothers. They they worked in people's houses. They worked uh, as in laundries. They worked. Uh, there weren't a lot of factories here in Pensacola, but they did domestic work. And as a result of that, the kids ended up here at this school. And Ms. Lilly was not impressed with the educational system that started in 1885 here in Pensacola. And so she started her own school. And a picture of those kids in 1924, uh, actually uh, many of those kids became doctors and lawyers and dentists, uh, teachers, uh, and, and some of them become business folks. And the ones that I've met, all of them were successful. Uh, of the 10 or 50 people that, that I found that went to school here, none of them did drugs, none of them were, had any dealing with the police, N many of them were leaders in their church, in their communities, and they were decent human beings. So Miss Lilly provided a tremendous service. So I was here only one year, um, and after that year, when I turned five, then I went to another school, which was not far from here, it was called J. Lee Pickens. Now that school is no longer here in, in, our, in our community. In 1971, the uh, state of Florida decided to run I-10 uh, through the black neighborhood. Now this was typical of Houston, Dallas, and almost Miami, you could name it. They, they did that. Well, you had two choices. Either you could run I-10 corridor, I-110 corridor, to, to the left or to the east, which in a white community, they had lawyers and doctors. That wasn't going to happen. Or the other, if you ran it four or five blocks to the west of that, then you would end up hitting our main uh, street, which was Palafox. And that was uh, an industrial, there were, there were businesses, there was railroads. So it was the most logical place. It killed the community that I grew up as a child. But it also did something that was maybe a positive note, is that the school that was there was named after a black doctor who lived three blocks to the east of us, and that was Dr. Pickens. And Dr. Pickens served for about 20 some odd years. His wife was Miss Verdell Pickens. She actually ran Spencer Bibb School. And you're gonna hear me talk about Spencer Bibb School. Mm -hmm. Spencer Bibb was a person that I did the 31 years of research that converted me from a biologist and a teacher to a, to a historian. Because I spent 31 years researching who he was in all the black schools in Pensacola the city schools rather. And as a result of that, that connection, uh, it actually got started. That school was there. It lasted from about 1950 to about 1981 for 30 years, most of the schools. And then, and then of course, I went on to other, you know, there were schools were segregated there and I went on to other colored schools. And in fact, I didn't actually see a white teacher until uh, I went to uh, Pensacola Junior College because all the schools I went were all a black experience. Uh, all of the schools were either named after doctors or some of them were community persons or educators. And so it, gave, it was a strong sense of community that I, that I continued. But that's how I got from, from Sixth Avenue to Miss Lily James to a block. I, I traveled within, I guess within a three mile radius uh, of six schools from, from Miss Lily James uh, which really wasn't a preschool. It was, uh, it was really what you would call four-year-olds would be, would be a primer grade. And then we had first, 
they didn't have kindergartens until much, much later. But first grade, up to about eighth or ninth grade, Ms. Linda James had. And then the rest of the schools within, within, this, within this mile perimeter uh, were schools that I attended. I grew up in, in there and taught. I've taught over 10,000 children. Uh, I've earned at least uh, uh, three different Teachers of the Year awards. And by the time I was 40, I had 40 other awards. And I never quit. But I learned that from Miss Lily James. And, and my mother, which was not Lily, but uh, was named Lillian. So for Miss Lily and Miss Lillian, I'm, 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 I'm Miss Lily and Lillian's boy, if you will. Boy in the sense that it means that I take great pride in my family roots. My father did not last and did not live a very long life. But my mother did. She died at 83 and raised a whole family. And like Miss Miller, uh, Miss Lily A. James actually founded a generation of people and affected the education of, of many people beyond her scope. And, and I'm here today as a testament that God is good and things go in a circle and everything is connected because I'm back home. I'm 75 now. I was forced. For 71 years, I've been halfway around the world, but I'm back in Pensacola and I'm back at Miss Lily J. I think that's amazing. For me, it's, it's not by accident or by luck. You know, and I, I take great pride in that. Wow. Yeah. Well, since I have this opportunity to actually talk to a student <laughs> of Miss Lily's class, right. I wanted to ask you. Um, I know you were only you only went uh, basically. I would you you could say the equivalent of kindergarten. Really. Kindergarten, right? I mean, yeah, uh, which, which would have been prima uh, in the old school system. Right. Right. For one year. For and one then year. for one year, right? And then I started school. See, at five, because I was a precocious child, at four, my mother brought me here because she had to work. And so that's how I got to school. She walked me every day. We walked here. We'd walk up Sixth Avenue, go through uh, Spencer Bibb School. There was a 10 foot uh, um, um, slide. There was the old school building there. There was a one room schoolhouse. I used to got to look in that school. I never knew. All of those images were designed to, for me. I wanted to be a doctor as a kid. I thought, well, I'll be a doctor. I'll work on people. I'll fix stuff and, and do whatever, you know. And, but I got to be a doctor. But a, I got to be a doctor of the heart and mind and not a doctor of the body. And, but it, it, it really all works out in the same for each his own, for much is given to those that much is, is expected. So the, the schooling actually changed my life, and I didn't know in many ways, you know. So your mom uh, basically was kind of a daycare as mm -hmm. well. Right, a daycare. You yeah, were, oh, well, let me tell you a little bit school. about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, school started at 9.30 in the morning, and, and, and most of the schools, uh, the colored schools, and, and, well, most of the schools in, in, the, in the county started at 9, uh, between 9, 9.30, mm -hmm. and were out around 3.15 or 3.30. So at Mr. Little James School, because the mothers work, uh, and, you know, many of them worked jobs where they worked with families and didn't get off to five or six o'clock. You would stay here with Miss Lily James. So I don't remember what kind of activity she provided, but she actually kept the children in school here. So she, she serviced these kids. She fed them like a daycare would have done. She, she kept them and, and they were happy uh, in, 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 in this cruise quote, one room school, because it was a one room school. It was a large room now. This section we're in now, uh, about half of this building, where the steps are, would have been the big large room. Four, five, and six year olds were in one section in the room. The six, seven, and eight year olds were in another section of the room. The nine, 10, and 11 kids were in another, but in one room. She taught reading, phonics, writing, geography, language, uh, map reading skills, all of those were in that curriculum guide in 1893 that I found. Ms. Lilly had those things done. And penmanship, right? You learn how, by the time you were around second or third grade, cursive writing. So all of those things were taught. I don't remember her having a ruler or a paddle. In fact, in the 1893 curriculum guide, it said corporal punishment was not accepted. I was amazed, because I got a lot of weapons at school. Not, not every day, you know, not every other day, but I got my fair share of what I needed. 
But whatever it was, she taught one person. I don't remember co-teachers or whatever in that room. And like I said, of the 50, between the 10 and 50 people that I actually interviewed and talked with about their experiences and my life experiences, they were happy at this school. So obviously she loved children. She had 16 children. Chappie was one of 16 children. His, his sister, Miss Lily Jane Frazier, was the first English teacher that was black at PJC that integrated in, I went there in 1964. So uh, there was a colored, if you will, or black junior college that was created in 1941. It closed in 65. And all of those persons who went to that school and graduated, many of those have come from similar experiences like myself, okay? Very successful people. There were doctors and lawyers and, and, and counselors and, and, you know, a pharmacist, you name it. They came out of that ex at black experience. So education provided a stepping stone for a lot of it. In my family, no one, you know, in modern times, between the 40s and the 60s, no one did not finish high school. My son almost did not finish high school. He was a knucklehead. He was lazy. But none of the people that, that in our communities, it was a great sense of pride to get it, to earn a diploma. For so long, between 18, uh, 1885 and 1913, you couldn't get a diploma. You could only go to eighth grade. So education was prized because in Georgia, in Mississippi, and Alabama, states that we're still having a lot of repression against our freedoms, they would not let you read and write to the point of putting you to death. In Florida, because of the Spanish, we had a whole different tenure. In fact, you are allowed to, to work and to read and to write and to be a decent person. But in those states, they were very repressive. And so they are today, too. Um, and so the things that were done then as survival for black people, you will finish high school. You will not be a problem to the teacher. You will. You represented your family. It would, it would be a sense of dishonor to go, to have your mom to go to school. And if she went more than once, more were you, you know? But she didn't have to, because you just didn't do that, you know? And so the neighborhood, uh, the community values and education were, were big part. Church values, almost, I can remember uh, being in a, in, a, in, a, in a Protestant church where there were 20 to 50 children, 20 to 50 children, and they had similar values. Their, their parents worked. They were, were middle class, or sometimes I mean lower middle class families uh, that owned their own home, that sent their kids to college, believe it or not. Uh, and, but it all started in church and in school. And, and, and so this, this particular school was an extension of that in many ways. We owe Miss, Miss Lily James a, a tremendous, I wish I could hug her today, you know. She raised one of the greatest pilots we had, a great American, but she raised all of us the, of that 50 that we know, and I don't know how many others that, that went to school here, but I don't know anyone that went through this school during the time that I was there between 1940, excuse me, 51 and the 60s. Uh, that, that weren't successful. You were expected to be somebody. You were expected to represent someone. And so the, the life that we live was a, a direct result of that. Okay. I was noticing, um, were there any other like ethnicities, say, that went to the school that you can recall? Like I, Jewish people, for instance? I, I'm not really sure. If you look at some of that, some of those kids were what we would call they would be mulattoes or colored, uh, you know. I'm not really sure, because uh, during that time you saw kids as being kids, either kids a little brighter, a little darker, whatever, you know, you know. Because where I grew up on 6th Avenue, 7th and 8th were all white. The block that I grew up in, I grew up in an integrated neighborhood, a neighborhood where we played with white children. You spent the day, uh, you, when Sunday came, you went to your church, and they went to their church. But on the weekends, you played together, and you were with these kids. And so, uh, but whether 
uh, uh, there were probably stricter rules for that. Uh, I have Jewish friends now. I've taught a lot of Jewish kids, and I've taught a lot of other ethnic ethnicities, uh, Asian kids and others, you know, that I can remember uh, when I started in 1970. I mean, when I when I uh, started teaching in 1969, uh, the the kid the Ross that I got, you know, there were were 150 kids. Uh, there were probably 40 to 50 black kids, and the rest was a combination of everything. In fact, some of the kids that are, that are grown now, I take great pride, they, they grew up. And in fact, the, um, the, um, the, the, um, uh, uh, the Jewish temple that's around there, when I go there, they know me because uh, the Rosenbaums and, um, and, and, and the, uh, uh, the Olsons, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the Ordens uh, that own, they, these were merchants in Pensacola. And that's another thing about Pensacola. It's always been multi-ethnic and multicultural. Therefore, the, the, the wave of racism that these other places had, it was milder in Pensacola. Uh, you could live your life. You didn't have to worry about whether people, police, we, ne we never saw police in our neighborhood. We were not abused in our neighborhoods. Uh, we did not call, get called names in our neighborhood. Um, you were expected to pay your debts, uh, live your life, and you, uh, you had a modem of being a decent human being. And so um, that was in this little small community. I don't know what other communities were like, but it was probably a, a, the same throughout Pensacola. You know, um, There was a color line and there was a separation. But in many ways, uh, children uh, grew up in mixed neighborhoods. They were multiracial. But in terms of actually remembering whether there were different racial groups in this time, that didn't probably happen until maybe the 50s or 60s. But I, I don't know. You probably have to ask someone else. I, I was probably a little too young to remember, you know. Um, but, 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 that's, but the neighborhood was one thing, and the school was another in terms of uh, interracial mixing. You know, uh, but uh, but 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 still, it was it was it was a wonderful time as a child. I, I had a great time as a child. I grew up a city child, but actually, I'm I'm a, I'm a boy from the country, because my mother, when I was uh, five, a year after I was in a public school, had left here, uh, and actually, the family moved in. They were from Quintet which what we call out in the country was near, near uh, Cantonment. And that area uh, of, 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 the, of the town, which was the north, would be the north, I guess the northeast side of town, further out, uh, those particular groups of folks that lived out in those areas were rural folks. And that was a whole different, you know, they, they had white neighbors, they interacted with whites on a regular basis, and so it was, uh, it was less of a color line there. Uh, and, and so it made, it made things uh, a, a little different. Uh, and, and it also made it uh, a lot less stressful uh, than, than it probably is now, or at least was in the 60s. Uh, but uh, it was, it was um, like I said, it was, it was a good experience. Or growing up, you know, you could grow up and be a child, and and and, uh, and children need to be children, you know, uh, and 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 that's that's what I remember of that. Well, let's let's get back to the school, which you uh, right. um, now the school was on this property. Well, it was physically on this property, on this property. Uh, like I said, just where we are physically in this room, the the building was okay. a large building which extended. Uh, which would have been like a one, uh, which would, would have been like a dog trot farmhouse. I don't know if you know what that is. Okay, it's really a, a two-sided two building that was wood. It either had a, uh, it usually had either fireplace or, or most of the schools throughout Pensacola was, were one-room schools up until about 19, to the early 1940s. And, and, and so they had a, 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 a large pot belly stove that they used coal and wood in, or they had a fireplace. I don't remember the physical structure of that, but from my experience of doing research on most of the schools, that was kind of typical. And um, it was a, a large school. If you look at the buildings that were, were, were here, they were, they were uh, tongue and groove, means that the wood was overlapping. Um, and um, and it were, like I said, that room was a large, large room. 
Uh, and but the one thing I do remember was was when the bell rang, uh, the children would line up. They would come in. I, I remember that. Uh, I remember we said the pledge, and someone corrected me the other day and said that in God, in you know, under God was added in '51. I didn't know that. I just thought God was always a part of the flag. <laughs> Silly me, you know. I can't remember everything, but. Uh, but it was a unique experience. Uh, the other thing that I, that, that I don't remember that I did find out about schools like this one was that they had calisthenics. In other words, there was exercise. Uh, Mr. Kellogg, John Kellogg, and other persons during the early 1900s had a health movement that th went throughout the country. And they pushed actual children moving, so they actually exercise every morning. You you march in place or, or sing and dance and, and and whatever. That was a part of your 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 daily routine. And then you someone would read a Bible verse or or, or, or say that. I don't re actually remember that. It's probably that I've done with so much reading that, you know, that it just seemed to be that. But I, but it was consistent throughout all the other schools. So it probably occurred here too. But, but, but that's what I remember. I remember school was a fun place to go. You know, I was always sad to go home, you know. I mean, uh, my mom would come and get me and, you know, because you played with kids, you had recess, you had lunches, and, and, um, and it was a large group of kids. There were probably maybe 20, uh, maybe between 20 and 30 children uh, in, in the picture that you see in 26. That number was probably consistent throughout that uh, time that, that the school was here. Which was amazing to me. Yes, it it yeah. is amazing. Now, now was she by herself as far as the teacher? Did she have right? She she did not have a co-teacher or an assistant teacher. She was the one person that actually did it all. And 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 you would you would think, well, how much logistically? How do you do that? Now, see, I've taught 150 kids, and I can tell you, teaching, and I taught seventh grader. I busy as as active as, as seventh graders are, and opinionated as seventh graders are, and as moody as middle schoolers are, you know. And I love them because I'm just like them, you know. And so, so the thing that was really amazing to me is that you you had a separate set of things to do, and that 1893 curriculum guide kind of bared that out. That. If you, in first and second grade, you, you worked on your, your numbers, your writing, your phonics, right, your alphabet. That was consistent for all the schools that I, people that I interviewed over this 30-year period, 30 year period of doing all this research. So that would have been consistent in fourth and fifth and sixth grade. Now, I have worked in summer programs, and I've worked with a lot of different children. And if there's a large group, and I, 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 we used to do 10,000 kids at the environmental center that I worked at the school district, but we would have set groups, like maybe four year, or, I mean fourth graders or fifth graders or second graders. But when there was a large group, if there was something that needed to be done, or I could, I could teach a lesson on the spur of the moment. I don't know where I got that from. I think it was probably the church, because I, I taught Sunday school from the time I was five until I was almost 25. So I've been a teacher all my life, you know, and uh, and so uh, I noticed that if you put kids in groups and give them specific things to do for something that they really will put their attention to, you know, like paper airplanes. We've done over a thousand kids. I've done 250 kids and taught them how to fly paper airplanes right here. And all it took was a pencil and a piece of paper. But then I had a lot of experience. So I'm sure Ms. Lily James over time, you know, would that would be her approach, but I don't remember a second teacher. Now, in some schools uh, in our county, uh, there were co-teachers. Some people taught second and third grade, or fourth and fifth grade, but to teach grade one through six or seven, that's, that's, that's been artistic, you know? Because one, you had to maintain order. Two, you had to do what you were told. Three, you would, I would, as a teacher then, I would have to have me a paddle or something I could speak with, you know. But, but I don't, I, you know, I, she just, it was a tremendous person to do that. And, and I marvel at any of the schools that I did the research on in finding that uh, at, this one school was uh, uh, in Warrington, near the, near the uh, NAS, uh, in a black section of town. 
in that particular that particular school, um, the teacher taught like fourth and fifth graders or second and third graders, or in some years, depending on the age of the children, if they were fourth grade, it would be about eight year, eight or nine. So if you had eight or nine year olds, you could teach every nine to seven year olds. And I learned that really well. And like I said, I worked, I did summer camps and things like that. So I, got, I had a lot of experience working with children. But the, if you had activities and things planned for them, they would do it. But you had to be in control. And I was never a person that, I didn't believe in screaming and yelling, even though I have a huge booming voice. And I usually can control children with my voice. But there are times I've had seventh graders that I spent a whole year and I couldn't control nothing. You know, they were typical 12 and 11 year olds. They had hormones running through their bodies. One minute they were flat crying, the next minute they were in love, the next minute they wanted to kill their mom, next minute they wanted to kill the cat, the next minute they wanted, they could pick up a, they could pick up an animal or a worm and be so moved by it. But these are children and so, if you learn the nuances of children, then you can do that. But I, I just, I have a lot more respect for her teaching now that I've gotten much older. Uh, well, that to me is, is absolutely astoundingly amazing that you can have control over, by yourself, right. over this. You can do it. Uh, yeah. apparently but so. you have to have, first you have to have discipline. And, and when I say discipline, discipline in the sense of, uh, not necessarily discipline in terms of speaking or whatever, is that whatever you organize and do that, you're in control. And the mere fact that you could speak meant a whole lot. You didn't have to, but you, if you needed to, you know. And sometimes, uh, if you know anything about little fellas, uh, four, five, six, seven year olds, they love to hug people. Uh, I worked as a middle school. When I got to be the elementary coordinator for the school district in science, I would go in and, and do a lesson or work with someone, and I would I, I would tell, I would get a, I would get twenty or thirty hugs before they, uh, they would do that. I took twelve thousand five hundred students to Big Lagoon, twelve thousand five hundred. Created a project, took them there, taught them how to do that, and I got more hugs. Uh, from, you know, from the little fellows. But that's just the nature of it. And I'm thinking, why do we lose that between five and, say, 15? I know it's growing up, you know. We, we, kids get their independence and all that stuff. But, uh, but I, think that, I think that some of that is the innateness. They say teachers are born and, and not created. I disagree. I, I was created because I, I grew up in the church. I taught uh, uh, classes, and, and then I worked with children all my life, you know. By the time I was 10, I could change diapers, iron, sew, wash, and cook. 10. I could do all the domestic things that were done, that could be done. I, my mother taught me, but I had learned through, you know, uh, through, through, and, and it's kind of unique in that uh, the, some of the better teachers that I've seen in, in, my, uh, in my, my 30, almost 34 years of working in the school district. Uh, it, it's just something that some people have. Some people will never teach children. They, 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 they just can't. It's either their personality or whatever it is. But, you know, and I have a, a, a lovely wife who was a very bright person, who was a valedictorian of her, her high school class, taught science, biology, chemistry, anatomy, physiology, and, and she was very good. I taught middle school science and was very good. I was a teacher of the year at least three separate times at three different occasions. But then again, I think it was the drive to be good, but to be very good at what you did and to take great pride in it, personal pride in it, is something that you have. But I've noticed that teachers in schooling is that you can, you can be taught. You can actually be taught how to teach people. But if you don't like children, and if you don't like uh, you know, dealing with, with kids or different age group kids, you're never gonna be a good teacher. You know? that's, that's just the way it is. That's what I found in almost 40 years of it, being an educator. You know? Well, I feel like there's a lot, lot more we could talk about, Mr. <laughs> Dr. Williams. But um, could, what, uh, let's, uh, let's go to yes. uh, the the, your role here now yes. uh, for the Chappie James Museum. All right. You want to tell us like A little the, bit about that. Well, yeah, I'm actually ahead. learning my role because uh, one of the things that, 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 that I was blessed in that uh, before coming here, I had taught uh, public school 
uh, I taught science, and then I got a promotion, and, and I was in the science department. So I was coordinating middle school science throughout the school district. I had about 11 middle schools and over 100 plus teachers that I actually supervised and worked with. So, so that was an asset. The last promotion I had before I retired was as the uh, coordinator of the Royal Hyde Environmental Center. When I got to the Environmental Center, uh, it is a 120-acre uh, plot of land out in, out, in, out in the woods. It's 120 acres. We had pitcher plants or whatever. And our setup was that children would come on buses to the center. Uh, we would have more than two or three at one time. So we actually took them on tours throughout our building. And so I was a docent, if you will. I was in charge. But I chose to teach every day because I don't, I, I could have sat in the office and do that. I, that would have drove me crazy. But I actually love working with the children. So I actually taught the children. So uh, that meant I had to learn about the center, uh, the dog trot farmhouse that I alluded to, that this building uh, that we see behind us, which would have been. Um, and, um, and so actually I was able to lead children on various groups. We, we had second, of, of fourth and fifth graders that came, but we also had uh, people from the community. After hours, uh, we would actually go to schools and work with uh, kids on improving. Schools with them were graded, which I think is really horrible, but they were graded A, B, C, D, and E, depending on how kids scored on their math and science and English, uh, you know, the testing business, which, which really doesn't have a whole lot to do with children really learning. Uh, you learn how to test and you learn how to take tests, but you don't necessarily learn how to be a better student. Uh, and so we, we did that after hours. We, uh, we were through at one school system. We worked until five o'clock. And so I would actually do a lot of uh, community work. People would come and bring groups, you know, various groups to, to do. And of course, it was about the environment, which I love, and science, which I love, and uh, in history, which I, I was a closet historian. I never knew I was a closet historian. And so I'm out of the closet now. <laughs> and now, in, out of the closet and into the building. <laughs> so, but in terms of, of here, uh, we, we have the same type of setup. We get groups that come, uh, and these groups are. Uh, will set up a tour. They will actually see the museum, which meant you, you had to learn. I've read probably four or five books on Chappie James. And, and the other thing is I've had a closer connection being a member, you know, a, an alumni of the school and then having a relative that actually flew with Chappie James. And, uh, and so that was one of those Marions that we talked about. And, uh, and so, um, you know, how you organize a group uh, and how you set up the resources so that if you had, say, 30 kids and you only have space for actually 10, you set them in sections and move them along. Uh, and we have a flight academy, which has been around for 29 years, which children love. And, and my goal is to actually double the space for that. We're, we've got a big grant coming, about $375,000, where kids who actually go into the flight academy actually set at simulators, which are computers, will teach them to fly. But see, I get the most fun part of all, because I get to teach them the science of flying. And they don't believe that they can fly yet, but that's my job is to create an atmosphere where they will actually think, boy, I actually flew today. And so when they leave, they have a different perspective. It's all in the mind. But also, you end up having to have a tremendous knowledge, which I do. And like I said, I've been blessed with a, with a really great memory, but I can't remember my name most days. But, <laughs> but it, it seems that I, it's insignificant. And things that really, really does excite me is learning different things. So I had to learn the technology of what the building in Chappie James and the Tuskegee Airmen were and how to set it up. So I actually learned how to be a docent. I learned how to do that. I learned how to do it, to manage that. I've, I, I worked, I had five or six employees. I'm used to working with people. I worked with 10,000 kids a year. Uh, when I got to the museum, I mean to uh, the Royal Hyde Environmental Center, we started out with 4,000. When I left there, we were doing 10,000. I took 12,500 to Big Lagoon, in addition to doing regular kids at that center. I was doing perhaps maybe 100 to 150 uh, uh, 
uh, instance in the community at schools where we would go and actually teach uh, science and different deal. And, and so um, it, it was just a, like a training deal. The other thing that I'm having to do now is the, to get the public involved because one of the things, being a museum that's been here only three years, we're one of, um, I guess, 60 different museums. Uh, FPAN is an organization of African American Museum from Pensacola to Miami. There's a big chart out there. Those museums are all, they're culturally different, they're historically different, but basically they tell our story to the community. And that's wonderful. Because, like I said before about history, history to me is, it's like a giant pie. African American history is one slice of the pie. Jewish history is one slice of the pie. Uh, Irish history is one slice of the pie. If you put it all together, then you have American history. So that at each of those museums, depending on where they are, culturally different, and that they, they tell one slice of the story of Florida, which was not done before. And, and, and so our FAN organization is, is a very strong organization. And, and that is there. So I have to be a director. Uh, I'm non-paid. Uh, I'm a volunteer. I probably will, uh, I would probably end up, I used to uh, volunteer and do a thousand hours in the community. I have uh, a couple of lifetime achievements awards. And by the time I got to be 40, I had all of this experience. For some reason, people like a guy who smiles and knows things, you know. But people also know uh, they like a person who's understanding and compassionate. So I've tutored kids from the time I've been five, really, <laughs> to 75. Uh, I volunteer, you know, at various groups. So all of that is a tremendous asset for this facility. We need to add more volunteers. I've raised a lot of money in the community. So I've been, I've been a fundraiser. I've run a 501c3. Uh, and, and the things that you need to be a good administrator does not necessarily make you a good teacher. It's a different set of skills. And I've had that experience. So it's an asset for the city of Pensacola because we're a city museum. Um, and, um, and so we want to expand this place. We want more per kids coming and being trained on the flight uh, academy because those young people uh, are going to go and fly the airline planes. They're going to be stewardess. They're going to be mechanics. They're going to be uh, military people. And for young black persons, and, and young women particularly, and I'm into young women, in that I want to be sure that a child, no child, is, should be limited by the color of his skin. And the content of his character is something that we, the community, have to build. So that the opportunities that are out there, so that you see you yourself as a, as a little cog in a big wheel, or you see yourself as the wheel itself. My goal is to teach kids how to be a part of that wheel and to be successful. You know, so whatever that takes, uh, it starts with the teacher and the interaction, and it starts with the idea that you can be successful, that you are somebody. You are connected to God, and you're connected to each other. You have to have a good heart and a good mind. And you have to work hard. And you have to never quit. You have to do what Miss Lily James taught me in 1951. And what Lillian taught me from the day that I sat at her side and was able to do all those things by 10th grade and able to share that with person. You have to want to do that. My children, I have two kids. My son is, um, is uh, I said he's a knucklehead, but he's a smart knucklehead. Uh, he failed algebra three times, but he taught calculus and algebra to kids at a minority church. My daughter, uh, at 36, had her own law firm. Now she has four, 14 lawyers and 10 other persons. So academically, we are George and Judas great-grandchildren. And George and Judah William thought that education was something that was prized. So my children think that it's prized. They also think that it's okay to be kind and loving of other people. But, they, but they're 
but their excellence really came from Mr. Lily James and my mother Lily and my father, who was like a quiet Joseph in the Catholic Church. He was a supportive person. He was there. He never raised his voice. He never spanked me. And, but he made me, every day he would come home, I would think, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. And I can remember today my children saying that. And so that kind of uh, respect and love is something that you teach by example. And that's another thing I found in that 1893, yeah, that we should teach by teach that precept and example. This was a guy, N.B. Cook, who had a third grade education and a Ph.D. in life. He lasted 28 years. He brought in public schools. He brought in books. He created outhouses. He put a school system everywhere from Pensacola Bay to, the, to, to actually uh, the Alabama line. Every school district had a school in it. He did not count out the people that were going to be educated. And I get choked up about that. Because the things that's really amazing to me was that if this was a guy who was a Southerner, who thought that education was important, who didn't get very much, but he set the tone, thank you, he set the tone that was amazing for children. He made it possible for kids like me to be successful. Miss Lily James made kids like me become successful. So all of the 10,000 plus kids that I worked with, and the 12,000 that I taught them how to love the Bay and, and to actually appreciate nature, was, 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 it, was, it was something that, I, I don't know if I would have, I don't know, I don't know if I had I gone to this school or been born in this community, or been the, uh, the great grandchildren of slaves, would I had that view, you know? So, so it, it, it is a, it's an honor to be in greatness with Champion James, but, but I see in him his mom, and I see in him the possibility, and the kids who come to our flight academy that, that are gonna learn how to fly a plane. For $200 an hour, they're gonna actually learn to fly a plane. I never flew a plane, but I taught them how to fly and how to dream. And I think that's the beauty. I think that's what teachers do. And we underestimate that in this country. It, it, it is, if it wasn't for teachers, the black teachers that I had because of segregation and all the other teachers that made it possible for me to be successful in my life, they made it possible so that someone could hear that you've got hope. You can make it. Don't give up. Don't quit. You can dream and you can be successful. If, if that is what we are about in this country, the one thing I like to say when people come here, if you don't believe in we the people, then I don't need to talk to you because you don't believe in America and I believe in America because America made me possible. It made us possible. It made the nation possible. And we really are in a good place. We're not financially in a good place now, but the future is something that has not happened yet we can still have an impact. And that's where we are. And that's really, while this museum will be successful long after I'm gone, this community be, will be successful. And the good things that you learned in life can be shared. So it's worthwhile. Uh, Dr. Williams, thank you uh, so much. But I'd like to ask you one more question. One more question. And Just one. Okay, maybe two. Okay, go ahead. Okay, All right. we'll see where this goes. We'll see where it goes. I would just okay. uh, I'd like to ask you if there's anything that you want to talk about or discuss that we have not uh, mentioned. No, I think I've covered it all. I, 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 I try not to ramble because sometimes no. I, 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 you know, I try to stay focused. Um, I, I think it's really, for me, to, to be here at this place at this time, after 71 years. Can you imagine the probability of that? Statistically, it's like one in a million. The chance of you winning the lottery. But I've won the lottery more than once because every time that I've got to deal with a kid or deal with parents and deal now with the community, it is that I represent Pensacola. I represent the city where I, and, and I represent those slaves that came on that ship that survived horrific things. Am I bitter about that? No. Do I love America? Yes. 
Is America a place that I would, I would rather not be any other place? So therefore, whatever we do, if it uplift, like Chappie did, if you uplift God and country, and I believe in both, I believe that with the things that we have and the opportunities we have, education is really the key. And, and I would not be here. And, and, and I would not have the impact of being able to see and to work and to do with so many people. But I, it's, 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 it's the joy that I take in working with children. It's because when I see a little fella, whether it's four years old or three years old or two years old, a baby in, in, a, in a crib, or if it's a, to see someone who's taught their lives and have worked to make things better, Chappie made things better for us. He said that I'm brilliant, I'm loving, I'm not going to quit. He was told more than on eight occasions that he would never, ever get Navy wings. He never got the Navy wings. He taught 997 black young men how to fly. He was shot down twice, flew 100 missions in Korea, 75 missions in, in Vietnam, and he was never bitter about it. And he died at 58. I'm 75. I've outlived my father. I may not outlive my mother. But if people represent our country, have that attitude, that if, when I look out and see the diversity uh, in, our, in our city, in our county, particularly in our city, because our city is it, just, it's, it's a microcosm of America. We were brought to Florida in 1559 on slave ships. We didn't get here in 1619, like you said. We were already here. A hundred of us came as slaves. We built, we built the roads, the cemetery. We built the canals. We built the bridges. We built the forts that still stand. Forts from 1883, 1839, 1835. They're still standing. They're still there built with slave labor. And we are incompetent. We, were, we're, 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 we don't have the ability. We never believe that. You cannot kill the human spirit. God is too powerful. I don't believe that. I'm a living witness that things can be better. So I thank you for, for letting me share. Because the persons, if they understand that, if you can import that to another person to give them hope and faith and belief in themselves, you have created a human being. That's really what you've done. And, and I think that's worthwhile. And I, and I, and I thank you. Wow. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Williams. Hmm. So with that, I think we'll uh, end the interview. All right. Okay.